doesn't work so well, and where it doesn't work so well. And the purpose behind this will be to then um, maybe think about the cases where it might not work so well in the moment and how to fix it. I should also say ahead of time that this is not going to be about an implemented system. It's about a concept that I think is fairly promising, but has not been empirically tested yet. All right. So if you read the news, and I think one of the most striking applications of machine learning, while not quite there yet, but might be there in the next five to 10 years, is self-driving cars. Similarly, you might read about autonomous drones. You might also see that uh, machine translation has gotten really good quite recently. Uh, sometimes, as you can see here, even from, from images, from cameras, or from videos. Text-to-speech isn't quite there yet, but it's super, super promising, and people expect that it'll be really good in the next year or two as well. And uh, autocomplete on Google is quite good as well, uh, even if it doesn't quite uh, ascertain our intentions all the time. Netflix has pretty good recommendations, right? Uh, you go there, refresh the page, and it recommends movies that you might like. Similarly, Facebook is trying to show you things in your feed uh, that you might click on, that you might spend time on. And if you look at games, uh, there we often have superhuman performance by now. So for Go, I think uh, we're there. And in the cases where machine learning does work, I think it's a pretty great thing, right? It's really fast. On Netflix, you just refresh the page. Uh, you don't have to wait for a human to get back to you with recommendations. It's really cheap, much cheaper than human labor. Uh, it's always on. Uh, you don't have a human who has to sleep some of the time. It's continually improving, so data sets grow, and as data sets grow, uh, your, your systems get better. In some cases, it's superhuman, not in all cases, obviously. Uh, it's very scalable, so you can have a single system that is useful for hundreds of thousands of people. Now I want to consider some other tasks where it's, on the face of it, not really clear how to apply machine learning at the moment. Uh, Broadly, I would classify those as tasks of thinking or deliberation. Like, uh, suppose you're trying to think about, well, how can I find a girlfriend or a boyfriend? And you're considering different options. Maybe I should do online dating, or maybe I should go to bars. Uh, but you, you don't know what. Uh, can machine learning somehow help you there? Similarly, maybe you're thinking, how can I be happier in my life in general? It's kind of this vague question. Not clear that machine learning can do anything for that. Or maybe you're thinking, how can I be healthier, like should I go to the gym? If I go to the gym, what should I do? Uh, should I eat differently? What should I eat? Or maybe you're thinking about immigration. Uh, how can I become a legal US citizen? Uh, you might think about how to get a better job uh, or how to get more pay at your current job. Or maybe you're thinking about more altruistic causes, like how can I personally do something about global warming? Or can I do something at all? Should I do something? Or similarly, maybe you're thinking about global poverty. Is there something I can do? Should I do something? Or US politics. It's like this extremely complex system. You're trying to think about, well, should I get involved? Um, don't really know the answer. So we have all these vague questions um, where it's kind of hard to come up with good answers. And by vague here, I mean questions that are not kind of factual questions like, what is the capital of Germany? Or, or what's 86 degrees Fahrenheit in Celsius? I mean, questions where really your, your personal background kind of matters. Um, so questions like, what career is right for me, or how can I be healthier, where you can't just look up the, the answer and get it in, in a single um, response, but there has to usually be some back and forth. So how, how do we currently solve these sorts of questions? Uh, when I thought about it, I came up with this short list. I think there are probably other strategies that we do employ. Uh, but one thing we might do is we might ask our friends and family. right? So that's pretty useful, because they do know our background. And so I can ask someone, hey, do you know a job, maybe at a startup, that I could take instead of uh, being a postdoc, and they might have an answer. Or we might consult experts. Like If you're thinking about immigration, we might go to a lawyer, um, and they might, might help us with that. And they do have very deep domain knowledge. Or um, if you don't want to pay for a lawyer, maybe we'll just like, read on the internet through immigration forums to get better information about the question that we're wondering about. That's pretty useful, too, because there is a lot on the internet, obviously. Or maybe just sit down and think, because unlike machine learning algorithms, we actually have human-level reasoning ability, which also tends to be useful. Um, but all of these have uh, drawbacks to some extent, right? Like, if you ask our friends and family, they tend to have limited knowledge. They, they don't know in depth um, how immigration law works, for example. We can consult experts, but that is a lot of overhead. So. Uh, 
takes a lot of time to make an appointment and they also tend to be expensive and for some topics they don't even really exist. We can search the internet, but uh, there's a lot on the internet, uh, so it takes a lot of time to find the things that are most useful and uh, some of the information on the internet I've heard is also not high quality. And we might, we might try to just sit down and think for ourselves, um, but that's just difficult. So we have these different approaches to solving these problems. Um, and they tend to have complementary strengths. So I talked in the beginning a little bit about machine learning and how it's fast and cheap, always on, and that's really great. And then we have people who, like maybe they know our personal background, maybe they have like human level reasoning ability about deep domain knowledge, can like, use Google and other external tools and so on. So the question I want to consider today is, can we somehow integrate these two sources to answer vague questions? And if you think about um, like thinking about answering such big questions, then I think natural language is generally among our most powerful tools, right? Like, I personally find it really useful to just make notes for myself as I try to think through any topic, like writing down relevant considerations one way or another, things to think about in the future, structuring my thought process. Um, and similarly, like talking to other people is really useful. Like people might know things that I haven't considered or might just help me think through things even if they don't contribute new evidence. And that doesn't have to be in person, right? Like it can also be like a conversation by text or by email. So to make the problem of answering big questions entirely concrete, I, I want to consider a specific interface, say on your phone. Like, let's say it looks something like this. Uh, let's say it's an app where you can either enter a vague question yourself or you can pick one of an existing number of topics. Like in this example, like I'm feeling crappy, how can I feel better or what phone should I buy? two such examples. If you start a conversation by clicking on any of these, then um, you may land on a screen that looks like this. So that's a conversation that has a particular topic. Here in this case, how can I improve my mood right now? And uh, the task that we would need to solve to do better here is to build something that can send responses that go into this dialogue and that are helpful. So responses like this, uh, like let's look at, a, let's look at uh, some potential causes, have you, uh, have you had enough sleep might be two such responses. And then on the bottom, maybe there are some multiple choice questions that uh, we can respond to, or maybe it's just a free form response. So how can we build a backend for this sort of front end interface? Um, like in particular, how can we build one that makes use of kind of human ingenuity, but also machine learning? Um, so that's, that's the high level goal for this talk, at the top of our roadmap to integrate machine learning and people to somehow answer vague questions. So the structure of the talk is, is as follows. I'll uh, first think about, uh, about dialogue automation using machine learning, ignoring people. And then I'll introduce a system that I've been thinking about. Again, this concept has not been proven empirically yet. And then uh, you'll find that it's useful to think a little bit more about how crowdsourcing works. Um, and finally, I'll have some words on what, what if this actually works? What does the world look like? For both of the intermediate sections, I'll follow the same kind of structure, where I first talk a little bit about what existing approaches look like, uh, present one challenge that I think those pose, and then I'll present an alternative. All right, let's get started. Uh, let's first think about dialogue automation and existing approaches there. This is a big field. I definitely won't be able to cover all of it, uh, but I hope to give some intuition for like, what existing systems might look like. So broadly, in dialogue automation, um, the goal obviously is to have human-like conversations, but uh, there are two broad categories. One is goal-directed conversations, like if you're trying to book, say, a hotel or make a flight reservation, call your, call your uh, airline, then that's a goal-directed conversation where the goal is to satisfy um, whatever the customer has in mind. And there, the conversations tend to be pretty restricted. Like there's a specific domain and you only have to take into account some considerations, not everything. On the other hand, there are more open-ended conversations. Often people refer to those as chatbots. Um, and there, the goal really often is just to be as human-like as possible. In some sense, to, to pass the Turing test, although that is not always the explicitly stated goal. So I'll primarily talk about the second category, although in some sense, um, the goal that, that we have in mind for this talk is a combination of the two. 
So let's look at what the performance of those systems looks like. I think until recently, and I don't know the history too well, um, but maybe until two or three years ago, the performance of these systems was really not very good at all. Uh, and I'll show you one of the better systems. So this clever bot, uh, like the human, might have a conversation that starts with, are you a follower or a leader? And Cleverbot might say, no. Human might say, my name is David. What is my name? Cleverbot might respond, how old are you, David? It's already pretty good that it got the name right, uh, although it's not like the best response by any means. Human might say, my name is John. What is my name? Cleverbot says, John. That's pretty good. What is the purpose of being intelligent? Bot says, the purpose of life is to love God and love people. That seems kind of like a canned response, not quite appropriate. Human says, is the sky blue or black? Cleverbot says, I am 200 years old. Yep, not good. I think since, uh, since then, things have changed a little bit, and especially with uh, bots that have been trained on large data sets and, and use neural nets, things have gotten quite a bit better. Um, so now I think systems have like extremely basic reasoning ability. So you might, again, try the prompt that we just saw, where human says, my name is David, what's my name? As before, the machine now gets it right, says David. Are you a leader or a follower? No, that's better, it says, I'm a leader. So it correctly like, got that this is a choice between these two things. It picked one and gave a grammatical response. What is the color of a yellow car? Yellow, that's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, how much is two plus two? Four, also pretty good. Oops, apologies. How much is 10 minus 2? 72, not so good. So you can see like it can do things that it can learn by pattern matching on a, on a large corpus of data, but it can't really do any, any deep reasoning. Um, it does have some basic world knowledge just based on um, all the existing dialogues it's been trained on. So for example, a human might say, what do you think about Tesla? Machine says he's a good conductor. Well, that one went kind of wrong, but in an interesting way. What do you think about Bill Gates? He's a good man, arguably, that one works. What do you think about Messi? He's a great player, it's pretty impressive. What do you think about Cleopatra? Oh, she's very regal, nice. What do you think about England during the reign of Elizabeth? It was a great place. I think that is pretty, pretty amazing that it works as much as it does. But you'll find that if you have long conversations with search bots, they don't have a lot of consistency. Like you might ask the system, what is your job? Maybe it says, I'm a lawyer. Then you ask, what do you do? It says, I'm a doctor. So it's pretty clear that there's no coherent world model behind these conversations. It's just like some learned pattern matching based on large corpus with only a very small amount of generalization. I'll talk in a little bit more detail about how these systems work. But before I got, get there, I want to briefly review supervised learning. So in supervised learning, the approach generally is the following. You start with by defining some model space, either of functions or of conditional distributions. Uh, for example, the space of linear functions with some noise. So that means you have like some big like, cloud of potential functions that you might want to learn. And your goal is going to be to pick one of them based on your training set. So you have some training set of uh, pairs of inputs to your function or conditional distribution and outputs. Uh, so in the linear regression case, it might look like this, input one, output three, input two, output five, and so on. And now your goal is to fit the parameters of the function or conditional distribution that you're trying to learn to maximize the probability of that training set. If you do that for the, for the regression case, you might find that, well, there's one, of the, one, one function in this big space that works better than the others. And uh, maybe it's in this case, y equals one plus two x. So you've solved your training problem here. And uh, because you've done that, you can now use the learned function to do prediction, right? Uh, so if you get a new input example, say you get a new input four, you can now get a distribution or a function output for that example. So you might say, well, now that I know that my function is one plus two x, I can say y equals one plus two times four. So my predicted output is nine. This is a very simple example that I'm giving here, but I think uh, the, the same principle applies to much more complex examples. You might say that instead of using just linear functions for your model space, it's not going to be neural networks, where the parameter, instead of just being a, a bias, um, et cetera, for the linear case, is now the weights of your neural net. And then the training data, I guess in our case, it would be something like uh, transcripts 
and responses for various dialogues. So like a transcript so far and a next response based on dialogues that humans have had. Again, as before, you would fit uh, the parameters of your neural net to maximize the, the probability of your data set. Uh, and that would require you to do some encoding of, of the data set. Um, and then what you can do once you've trained or picked a particular instantiation of the parameters and thus a particular neural net, what you can do is you can give a new transcript to the neural net and get a predicted response uh, for an input that you haven't seen that wasn't part of your training set. All right, so what's, what's the structure of these neural nets? Um, in general and on a very high level, uh, they tend to be some sorts of recurrent neural nets where uh, over the course of a dialogue, the application might look something like this. So there's some internal state uh, which for neural nets tends to be some opaque vector uh, and that internal state gets updated over time based on the inputs. So I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of details here, um, but you can generally think about the um, little, little dots uh, here as vectors and the arrows or combinations of arrows in some cases as neural nets that process these vectors based on the previous state at each point in time and also based on the input. Once you define such a structured function, you can then train it on a large corpus. So you might have, say, a thousand to one million dialogues that you collected from humans, and then you fit the parameters of your neural net to maximize the probability of those, well, exactly those dialogues. So this is pretty good, and, and that's the sort of system that gave rise to the dialogues that I showed you earlier, the uh, slightly more impressive ones than Cleverbot. But it does have some drawbacks as well. So in particular, uh, because the thing it's trying to do is it's trying to give you the most probable response at every point in time, um, you have to wonder, is the most probable response really the thing you want? And I think often, often it's not. Like often you have some dialogue so far and the most probable thing for the system to say is just something generic like, I don't know, or I don't know what you're talking about, just because those apply across very many contexts. And another, another issue here is um, because the system doesn't do like any kind of look ahead, it might easily get into loops. Like, so here, maybe you start a dialogue as a human by asking the system, how old are you? And the system responds. I'm 16, and now you're just gonna feed the system's responses back into itself just to see where it goes. Uh, system asks 16, custom mark, uh, and then system responds again, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, system says, you don't know what you're saying. System says, I don't know what you're talking about. System says, you don't know what you're saying. And so it's in this infinite loop because it just tries to predict the next thing to say. Only very recently, people have tried to address this and uh, one way you can try to address this is by combining supervised learning and reinforcement learning as, as, deep, as in deep reinforcement learning. So just to very briefly cover this, you might uh, start in exactly the same way that we started before. So you have your neural net, you train it on some large data set using supervised learning. Um, but then you don't stop there, but instead you just say, well, okay, now I have some initial parameter set and now I'm gonna work, work with that and uh, fine tune it in some way. And the, the way you might want to fine tune it is you define some reward function that is a function of an entire dialogue. So not just of a like, single pair of a transcript and a response, but uh, of a longer, longer sequence of back and forth. Uh, this is a tricky problem, of course, because the real, like really this function, uh, to get it right, you won't want it to capture human judgment of how good, how natural this dialogue is. And so any heuristic you can actually compute from the data is gonna not be quite appropriate. But it turns out in practice, doing things like capturing semantic coherence is something that can, can be useful. So you define some reward function that takes in a dialogue and returns a number that says how good this dialogue is. And uh, what you do then is you take your system and you simulate many dialogues between the system and itself. And at the end of every dialogue, you update the parameters of your system neural net to um, make dialogues that result in high scores more likely and dialogues that result in low scores less likely. Uh, you might have noticed that this is exactly the same thing that AlphaGo is doing, if you, if you know anything about the implementation of that. Um, all right, so that, that, that is, I think, among the most advanced approaches to dialogue automation at the moment. Now let's think about like, how, how, how far can this go? How, uh, is this gonna solve um, the dialogue for the kinds of questions we're interested in, like these sorts of vague questions that require reasoning? And I think it's pretty easy to see that there's serious challenges here. 
again, like because we're in the setting um, of supervised learning, and I guess it's also true for reinforcement learning here, is that the data that we ultimately have to learn from are these pairs of dialogues uh, so far, so partial transcripts and next responses. So maybe here's a dialogue on where to go on vacation, which might be like where should I go on vacation is the first utterance, and then there's a response, where do you live? Uh, and maybe you have another instantiation of this that where the dialogue is uh, proceeded a little further, maybe another one. So we have these collections of uh, partial dialogues and responses, and that's our data set. And the task that our machine learning system now has to solve it is it needs to learn the function f that is between those partial dialogues and the next responses. This is, of course, like an extremely difficult problem because what you need to learn here is not just to understand language from scratch, but also to reason about the world and the content of those dialogues. Uh, so I think this sort of problem of remote supervision is particularly challenging if uh, you're in the setting of, of like, these sorts of vague dialogues where you're talking, like the intention is for you to talk to someone who actually thinks about what they're saying. Maybe they're considering uh, different things they might say to you next, or maybe they're taking into account different considerations. Maybe they're even looking up a definition, um, trying to reason through the things you said. And all of those kind of mental steps that happen between the dialogue and the next response are invisible. You're supposed to just learn them um, from these pairs of a transcript and a next sentence. So that's really hard. So I want to think about how we can help uh, address this problem of remote supervision. I think one, one uh, inspiration here is to think about uh, how human thinking proceeds. And I guess we covered this a little bit in the beginning, but like writing down notes is a really useful thing in many, many situations. For example, if you consider a doctor there, I think one thing that uh, is known to be very useful are checklists, right? Like if you go to a doctor, you have a conversation where they're trying to um, help you, trying to think through what are, are your symptoms, what diseases might be compatible with that, what should they recommend, uh, then for them to like, write down some of the things that you say, write down some of the things that they're considering addressing in the future, and maybe also going through auxiliary information like checklists is, is quite useful. Similarly, if you're talking to a therapist, they might make some notes about what you've said, things they want to talk to you about in the future, um, and that can help them structure their thinking as well. So this intuition of uh, using notes to organize thoughts is what I want to work with, where the, the notes, again, they capture key pieces of information, um, things to discuss, things to investigate in the future, and maybe templates and checklists that like, a person has learned are very useful. Right? Like if, if you were in the position of a doctor or, or therapist and you had your first conversation, probably the notes you would write down would not be quite like the ideal notes because you don't know or the things that really matter. You don't have a schema for how to talk to the person. But after you've had, say, 100 or 1,000 such conversations, you'll be really good at this because you know how to have those conversations. What things that the person says matter, what things don't matter, and how to think about the kinds of topics that you're discussing. To give another uh, very concrete example of this, like, suppose you're trying to help Bob find a girlfriend to re uh, resume the topic from the very beginning. You might start by making some notes about the general background of Bob. Maybe he's like 16 or 20 years old, where he lives, what he does, and so on. As you talk to Bob some more, you might uh, find that uh, you learn about his prior experience in relationships or with dating, and you structure that information. So in general, I guess when I think about these notes, I'll be thinking about these sorts of tree-structured outlines, but uh, there's no reason in general to constrain it to that representation. I just find it, it's, a, it's a useful representation to think about. And then you might have like really long notes where you add more and more information about things you want to talk to Bob about, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the kind of intuition I want to work with, uh, where uh, we'll similarly want to think about like machine learning systems that uh, have some sort of natural language workspace that they operate on, where they don't, at each point in time directly, have the task of coming up with an utterance to send to uh, the user or the dialogue partner, but instead, they need to choose what I would call kind of a cognitive action, like to make some change to their workspace. And uh, only occasionally they might send something to the, the person they're talking to. The reasoning behind this is uh, if you have these intermediate steps, you might be able to get more fine-grained supervision, like more insight into what is the system doing between what utterance and the next, and maybe also um, you might be able to provide some supervision on the actual reasoning steps that are happening. 
Okay, uh, let's walk through one example. Um, let's look at the, the kind of where should I go in vacation dialogue. So here, let me just explain the, the diagram that I have here. Uh, so in the bottom, I have the uh, initial workspace, just going to be empty. Over time, it's going to be some sort of outline. We have the supervised learner, which uh, I think we can assume is some sort of neural net, although it doesn't, doesn't need to be. And the task of the supervised learner is to take the workspace at the previous point in time and uh, return the action that it predicts to be useful. At some points in time, though not at all of them, uh, we'll also get utterances from the user, which we can take to be just added directly to the workspace. And that then results in the workspace in the next point in time. All right, so uh, let's walk through this over the course of time a little bit. So you start with an empty workspace, and uh, maybe your learner has learned, and we'll, we'll talk about how that learning might work, uh, that if the workspace is empty, it's best to just wait until something is added. Uh, then at some point, Alice gives her initial question, where should I go on vacation? It gets added to the workspace, and now it contains Alice, where do I go on vacation? Now the system might take a very small step from there, where it just rewrites the thing that got added to the workspace a tiny bit into uh, this sort of root level question, where should Alice go on vacation? Which is gonna be the thing that the system is gonna try and help with. Then, um, before sending any, any message back to Alice, the system might add another, another bit um, of structure to the workspace where it says, okay, well, uh, I've learned in the past that one thing that's useful to learn about when, I, when discussing that sort of question is what is Alice's background. Similarly, it might add another bit um, that says like, what options are there, like, what, what uh, options for where to go on vacation. So all of this is happening without any information being sent to Alice. This is all just internal kind of information organization. And then at this point, the system might actually send a message to Alice. So the way I'm implementing it here is by tagging a message with at Alice, although there's other ways of implementing that. Uh, so the system adds this message, where do you live, at Alice to the workspace, and it gets sent as an output to Alice. The system knows um, when I add such a thing to the workspace, it's usually good to wait. Uh, so it does, at some point, Alice says, in San Francisco, and it gets added to the workspace. And so it continues. Uh, maybe the system at this point does a small edit where it rewrites the pair of where do you live at Alice, Alice in San Francisco in a slightly shorter form as uh, Alice lives in San Francisco, and so on. I think the really important thing um, to note here is that these workspaces are human readable. Uh, and what that makes possible is a very fine-grained human support. So um, a human contributor might at any point in time you know, go in and make a change to the workspace. So if you notice that the system is not representing inf important information or is structuring the information in a way that doesn't make sense, a human could go in and could change it. Um, Similarly, the machine learning system might learn to post questions to the workspace. So you might, you might not want to train your neural net to do calculation, for example. Like suppose you're having some dialogues that require um, you to multiply large numbers. And uh, it may be better for the system to just post the question, what is 123 times 417? to the workspace and then wait for another system to post the response than for you to directly train your neural net to do that calculation. So the, the overall game that we are trying to play here is that of decomposing a problem into parts that machine learning can handle, um, parts that other systems like calculators or knowledge bases can handle, and parts that only human can, humans can handle. Let me give you, give you one more example of how such integration with other systems might look like. Uh, like suppose we're back in the setting where um, we, we have the dialogue on where should Alice go on vacation and uh, we have the sub-question, where does Alice live? Now, um, our system might have learned that one useful thing to ask here is what is Alice's IP address? And maybe then there's some other system, uh, like some web bot that can actually look up Alice's IP address and can add the answer to the workspace. At that point in time, our system might ask, what is the location for the IP address? And uh, maybe there's a third system that can only do one thing, which is like answer questions of the form, what is the location for that IP address? And that then adds the answer to that question. And now our system can kind of 
do the information processing to like gather together those two responses into a short sentence based on a P address, Alice lives in San Francisco. So we get an educated guess for the answer to the question where does Alice live without explicitly asking Alice just through the use of some other external systems. All right, so here I kind of just assumed that our system is trained already. Um, and we have to ask, well, how, how do we train a system like that? How do we learn that? Uh, and one obvious answer is, well, let, let's play the supervised learning game. We'll gather data of the forum workspace and next action at each point in time, uh, presumably from, from humans for the most part. Um, and then we'll learn a function that maps workspace to next action. Here, next action, again, is something like uh, adding a node to the workspace, moving something, editing something, deleting something, putting together with some necessary data, like what's the text that we're adding or what's the identity of the node that we're, we're changing. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail on uh, what exactly the functions here might look like, but it's quite similar to the um, neural net setting that, it, that I brought up before, where uh, maybe the function is a neural net that is kind of like the neural nets that are used for uh, translation, where you have an encoder and a decoder. So maybe an encoder that instead of taking a sequence of words, it takes a tree, encodes it into a vector representation, and then uh, by using an RNN, decodes it into an, an action to take. Maybe it also uses attention mechanisms. I think there's a lot of, uh, lot of interesting work to be done here in just trying out different sorts of uh, learners. But over, overall, the hope is that this function from workspace to next action is somewhat easier to learn than the function from dialog so far to next utterance because the steps are smaller and it's, there's more, um, more supervision on what is happening in between. All right, so that's, that's our approach to dialog automation. Uh, we'll learn these sorts of little cognitive actions on a workspace that is shared with human contributors. Now let me talk about like, how to like, turn that into a more complete system, like the kind of thing that you could actually plug into like the little app interface that I showed you earlier. Um, so the, the, we have one part, which is automating dialogues, putting these cognitive actions, but then the question is, how, how do you actually get the training data, right? Like, why would anyone contribute data to this? Uh, it's pretty important to point out that unlike uh, existing dialogue automation systems, we are in the setting where there is uh, basically no existing training data because we can't at least not directly train on existing dialogues. We have this other data that we want, I mean, these workspaces and next actions. So this needs to, become, it needs to come from somewhere. So the answer that I want to consider here is that we set up a market for both human and also automated contributions to that workspace, uh, where essentially we pay people to provide that information. So concretely, uh, again, if you go back to our app, we essentially have two kinds of users. We have people who are asking these sorts of vague questions, and then we have people who are doing some thinking or who are domain experts. For people who are asking questions, we've already seen the, the interface before. I'll make one slight change here. Uh, where um, I guess, well, two slight changes. One is I'll add a link to the workspace if people want to not just see their dialogue, but also the kind of hidden things that are going on under the hood. And uh, the other maybe more significant change is that I'll also add an option for people to pledge rewards towards the resolution of the big questions. So if someone has a question that they really care about a lot, they might put up 10 or $100 uh, and uh, that will fund contributions to the corresponding workspace. So abstractly, that's what it looks like. We have an asker, maybe they use an app on their phone. We have some dialog market server. Those two exchange both messages and also rewards. For thinkers and experts, uh, we can consider having some sort of web interface. So maybe the, the way it works is there is uh, a list of questions that people have posed that people can browse. So, uh, Maybe they can sort those questions by the most recent ones, the most, ones with most, most reward, the ones with the fewest contributions so far, or by topic. Um, they might look at any particular dialogue, see, well, how many contributions have there been so far, um, how much has been pledged, when was it created, and then experts or thinkers can pick one of those to contribute to if they like. If they click on any of those, so uh, maybe I'll click on the, the one I'm highlighting here, then they might come to an interface that looks like this, where again, there, there's a, a title and, and the reward, 
but then there's also the dialogue on the right, and uh, mm, that is exactly the same thing that we saw on, in the little mobile app interface before. But on the left, um, there's a workspace. So that's the same thing I was showing um, on the kind of sequential time series neural net illustration. So that might contain uh, parts where the, the both bots and also the thinkers are just thinking through potential um, considerations that might be important, like in this case, uh, where someone is trying to figure out why, why they're um, in a bad mood, that people might think through well, what are, what are potential causes for bad mood? Maybe it's lack of sleep, feeling thirsty, feeling hungry, and so on. Uh, or they might, might contain parts that are actually visible to the person that um, the system has, has a dialogue with. So things like this, where people are wondering, well, what is, what is the situation of the asker like? Uh, and then there are, again, these tagged responses where you say, well, well, let's first look at potential causes at asker before we had at Alice. Have we had enough sleep at asker? Maybe provide some multiple choice responses, and then we might get a response from, from the asker. Here I'm also um, doing another little bit uh, of indirection where instead of directly sending responses to the asker, I have this extra um, intermediate step where people or bots can vote on which response to send next, but I think that's not a, not a critical ingredient. All right, so besides the asker, we have uh, these other participants in our system, we, the human contributors, human thinkers and experts. And uh, there's another third group of users that is kind of filling exactly the same role as the human thinkers and experts, namely programmers who are writing bots. And uh, just like a human thinker expert can make some money by participating in the system, the thought is that a programmer can also write a bot that then if the bot does useful things, will earn some money for the programmer. I think there's really nice synergy between kind of this market idea and this dialogue automation idea because uh, obviously the market incentivizes contributions and so you have a, a way of getting training data but even beyond that, the market also incentivizes the creation of bots. So in some sense, you might not even want to start with the dialogue automation um, system. You might just want to start with so this sort of workspace and a market around contributions, and then people uh, might build bots. Maybe more interestingly, um, once you have such payments, you can use them as reward signals for reinforcement learning algorithms. So you're no longer constrained to the supervised learning uh, setting. But uh, there's a problem, which is you have these rewards, say $10, and now you have all these little contributions on the left. Uh, what do you do with the reward, right? Like who, who gets how much reward? It seems like a critical issue to resolve. And to think about this a little bit more clearly, I want to uh, look into crowdsourcing and you know, the way people tend to do crowdsourcing these days. So uh, I think, to my knowledge, most of crowdsourcing is happening on Amazon Mechanical Turk, where people can post tasks and then human workers can post responses and make small amounts of money. So the, the kinds of tasks you might find there are things like uh, ordering translations by quality. So you might, on the left, you might get some uh, potential in English sentences. On the right, you get potential translations. And now you're supposed to, uh, if you're uh, Chinese speaker, you're supposed to order those. Um, or another another task you might find on Mechanical Turk is uh, describing movie scenes. So there's a movie that's playing on the page, and uh, you can highlight different periods in the movie and describe what is going on there. I think both of these are used uh, to train machine learning algorithms, actually, or, or to evaluate those. Another task that is very common is something like finding the email or of a business or looking up the e the email. So something where people get the name uh, and maybe sometimes the website of a business and then they need to like, look on the internet and find the, like, the corresponding information. Some, some other uh, tasks you might find there are things like labeling images, like what, what, is, what is shown on this image, which kinds of objects are on the image, or uh, identifying which kinds of product reviews are real and which are fake, uh, or transcribing short audio clips. 
if you look at these tasks, then one thing they all have in common is their micro tasks. So uh, they all tend to be very short, like they can be done on the mat on the order of, of uh, seconds and sometimes minutes. But another another thing they have in common is uh, that they tend to have mostly fixed rewards. So uh, well, there's some tasks where you can earn bonuses if you do particularly well. For the most part, that does, doesn't play a big role. Uh, so human labor here is kind of treated as a commodity and like the contribution by one Turker is as good as, as one by another. Now let's, let's consider some other potential tasks you might want to put up on Mechanic Turk or tasks where you might want to um, distribute rewards. Again, here, here obviously the intention will be to then go back to the dialogue setting and think about uh, the tasks as the contributions to uh, a workspace. So here's, here's one thing uh, that would be fun to do. Like suppose there's some Wikipedia article maybe on microwork here in this case. And uh, suppose it's quite bad, it's like only a single sentence, uh, but you care about it being a lot better. Like maybe at the moment it looks like this, but you want it to look like this with many sections and detailed discussion of what microwork is. How can you make that happen? Uh, suppose the way you want to make it happen is you say, well, okay, I'm gonna pledge $100 towards the improvement of this Wikipedia article. And then at the end of this month, I'm gonna look at everyone who contributed, like everyone in the Wikipedia community who made a change to this article, uh, and there's probably gonna be many changes, and then I'm gonna reward them. Of course, then you face exactly the same problem as in the dialogue setting, which is how do you distribute those $100 over these contributions? Uh, like some of them are just gonna be fixes to typos, others are gonna be like additions of entire new sections. Again, others might just be vandalism, so you probably, almost certainly you don't wanna just uniformly distribute your money over these contributions. I think there's quite, uh, quite a few settings that are like this. Uh, so another, another case that is similar to this is uh, suppose you have a repository on GitHub with some code and uh, you would like to reward people who commit uh, code to that repository that furthers whatever goals you have for, for your code. Uh, you face a similar issue where some commits are really useful, others are just like minor, uh, minor help, and again, others are actually harmful. Or maybe you have a Google Doc and you're trying to brainstorm uh, some topic, maybe where, where to go on vacation or something more important, and uh, the people who are participating in your brainstorming, they can see the previous suggestions. There too, there's this issue uh, of how useful is a particular contribution? Like sometimes someone really has a big insight and sometimes it, something a person suggests is just a small variation on something that's already there. Maybe you're uh, trying to outsource a logo design and you're on one of those pages where people can see previous logo designs. I think that is actually a real, a real issue where uh, if you go to one of those logo contest sites and uh, the designers who are participating are contributing their logos, um, can see the previous designs, and sometimes it happens that like, someone submits a logo, and it's not like it's a pretty good idea. It's not quite what you want. Someone else submits a small improvement on it, then the small improvement wins, and the person who like did most of the work doesn't get anything. Or you might want to uh, outsource contributions to one of those dialogue workspaces to facilitate answering vague questions. So what, what all of these tasks have in common is uh, that they have these highly variable and like values and uh, not just that, but they're also kind of uncertain. Like if you look at any particular edit to your Wikipedia page, it's not immediately clear what the reward should be. It's kind of hard, hard to tell. The thing that makes this uh, a real problem is that you do want to pay in proportion to how helpful a task is. Like if you don't do this, then you're not gonna incentivize the most helpful contributions because people are just gonna like make some changes uh, knowing that they'll get rewarded either way. Um, but you can't easily um, pay in proportion to how helpful a task is because evaluating a task is so expensive in, in your time. Uh, so the overhead of evaluation might easily be bigger than the value of the task itself. So if, yeah, we have this problem where we can't evaluate our contributions. What we'll need to do is somehow choose a proxy uh, for the reward that tells us what to pay for any particular contribution. Uh, but we need uh, some condition to hold that is something like uh, the expected reward for any contribution is still the true reward that you would end up with if you did a deep, uh, expensive evaluation. 
if I think maybe, maybe this is not possible at all, uh, maybe you, there's just no economically feasible way of doing this. Uh, but one way to see that this is not true is to look at the following strategy uh, of randomized evaluation. So suppose what you do for each task is you just say, well, I'm going to evaluate with some small probability. Let's say it's 1 in 100. And only if like a flipper coin, it comes up heads, which happens 1 out of 100 times, uh, I'm going to evaluate the task and decide what, re what, I, what reward I should pay for it. But then, um, if it does get evaluated, I'm going to scale up the reward by 100. So if I would otherwise pay a uh, dollar, I'm going to pay $100. If it does not get evaluated, I'm going to pay nothing. This strategy has an expectation, the correct payments. Uh, so that's good. But uh, at the same time, it has extremely high variance. People are not going to like that 99 of 100 times, they're not going to get paid anything, right? Um, but I think it's still, like, still interesting that it is possible to have a strategy that has uh, correct payments and expectation, because it shows that our goal here is kind of to reduce the variance of the payments and without introducing bias or uh, without introducing a lot of bias. So he here's a variation on this strategy that you could pursue. Uh, We've seen supervised learning before, and uh, you might notice that we're, when we're evaluating a few tasks and uh, only um, looking at those, not looking at all of the tasks, we're kind of in the supervised learning setting, right? Because we have data for, for some things, don't have data for the others. Uh, what if you try to predict data for the others? So here's a strategy that you could follow is you could uh, evaluate a fraction of all the tasks that you get. Uh, and uh, because that fraction is potentially quite small, you might be able to spend a lot of time on each of those tasks. Now you have data of the form task and uh, uh, reward that you elicited. And uh, you can just pay uh, for those particular tasks that you did evaluate exactly the reward that you got. But then you have all these other tasks that you didn't evaluate. Uh, so here the proposed strategy would be, well, may you just predict the rewards for those un unevaluated tasks. I think there's many possible features that you could use as inputs into your prediction, right? Like in particular, I think metadata is, is a good candidate here where uh, like the task author is often really informative. Like the same person tends to make good contributions or tends to make bad contributions across time. You might look at the history of rewards of a particular contributor or you might uh, look at maybe judgments by other participants. Maybe your system includes like some form of downvoting or upvoting and there are particular participants who a really good judgment. Whenever they upload something or download something, it's really predictive um, of whether you're going to like it or not. Um, so, so that's the baseline strategy that you could follow. I think there's a lot of complications here, but I think they, they can be addressed. Uh, I want to go into a few of those um, because I think they're actually quite interesting for their own sake, independent of the dialogue setting. So uh, the first complication is if I ask you, well, I want you to evaluate this particular contribution, like this particular edit to your Wikipedia page, and say, and tell me, like, how much do you want to pay for this? Uh, that might be just a really hard question to answer, right? Uh, like, even if you give, even if I give you a lot of time, like an hour or two hours, it might just be hard to come up with like a good a good number there. But one thing, one, one thing I can do is I can ask you many more questions. I can ask you things like, uh, which of which of the tasks which of the edits to your Wikipedia page say were most helpful to you, which will look like they're least helpful. Uh, was this particular task more helpful than this other task? Uh, if you had to group these tasks somehow, like what bigger group would the particular task here uh, belong to? Uh, how helpful was this entire group? And so on. You, you can think about a lot of questions. Um, but the important point is like, if I ask you many, like for, for answers to many such questions, then if I define a formal semantics for each of those, I can use automated inference to infer like what kind of reward is consistent with that, with that set of answers. I might just take that reward then at face value or maybe I show it to you and ask you, well, does that reward seem right? Is it too high, too low? So that, that is uh, about doing deep evaluation in the few, few cases where you do to it. Another, another thing it, you might be worried about is uh, in the cases where we don't do deep evaluation, maybe the task features are just not enough to make good predictions, right? Like maybe you just can't take the author's identity and a bunch of other features to predict the rewards with any uh, confidence. 
there I think one, one useful thing to do is to reward predictive signals. Uh, like if uh, you have that person as before that I mentioned that always uh, upvotes things that you end up liking, maybe they should get part of the reward. Or maybe the way you make such a person exist is by having a system that pays uh, signals that help you eff effectively decide which things uh, mm, to give high reward with you, without you having to do deep evaluation. A third problem might be that, uh, I guess, plain terms, people will try to cheat uh, if, if you use some features to predict rewards. Like say, uh, you've learned that whenever people from Cambridge write something on your page, it tends to be really good and tends to get high rewards, then people will start saying they're from Cambridge, even if they're not. Um, there, uh, I think, to some extent, this is just a hard problem. Um, and uh, I think there are some machine learning algorithms in particular online learning that could help a little bit. But the other thing that could help here is also rewarding predictive signals. So some signals are going to deteriorate, deteriorate under market pressures. But then there are others, like the, the upvotes by the helpful person that I mentioned, that might not, uh, because that person might have incentive to keep them predictive. And then finally, I think it's just also the case that some tasks can only be valued in context, right? Like in the Wikipedia example, um, like suppose you see a contribution that is a deletion, like someone deletes a sentence. And there are different reasons for why that could happen. Like maybe they deleted it because they want to replace it with a better sentence, or maybe they deleted it because they don't like you and they want to vandalize your page. Uh, and there's a lot that, that can be done to address that problem. Like you can require people uh, to like batch their contributions in, into kind of semantically meaningful parts, like grouping, deletions, and ad ads, for example. You can always provide some context, like previous and following contributions when you're, when you're uh, requiring someone to evaluate a contribution. Or you can require people to annotate, and if people don't give good justifications, you can just give low reward. So that's the basic strategy that we'll be following for reward distribution. Uh, We'll only evaluate a few contributions in detail. Um, and we'll use machine learning to predict the rewards for the other contributions that we don't evaluate. So that's kind of the second in ingredient into uh, making the dialog market system work. We learn to predict rewards. All right, <clears throat> where, where are we at? Um, I, I started by talking about deliberation. Um, so we have these tasks. Uh, where some of them are really things that people care about a lot, uh, like finding a partner, get, being happier, being healthier, uh, thinking about how they can usefully contribute to the world, finding a better job, and so on. I talked about how we might start to automate deliberation um, by not directly learning to automate dialogues, like, so not directly learning to predict next responses given transcripts so far, by, but by learning these more cognitive actions on a workspace that is shared with human contributors. That, of course, pose, poses the problem of how do you uh, incentivize human contributors to make useful contributions to such a workspace. Uh, so we came up with this uh, idea of setting up a market for both human and bot contributions to that workspace. But that also was challenging because uh, you now need to be able to tell how good particular contributions are so that you can distribute the reward um, that is pledged towards a particular conversation. Uh, so we came up with this additional idea of just predicting most rewards and only doing deep evaluation for a few contributions. So that, that's uh, the combination of those two ideas is what, what I call dialogue markets. I think there's another point of synergy that I didn't mention before that is pretty important. Um, and it's that when you do deep evaluation of a particular uh, contribution, you can actually use the dialogue market system itself, right? Like that, this question, how much should I pay for this contribution? It's itself a vague question. Like, it, what, what does it mean? How much should you pay? It's kind of hard. Um, but you can try to think through it, like think through different considerations, like the kinds of triangulation questions I mentioned before, and that can happen through dialogue. Uh, and if you do that, then you can use the entire system, like including like the, the workspaces, the crowdsourcing, the automation on a, on a meta level. I think this is really nice because if that works, then like your, your reward distribution will also improve over time, making your system work better and better. So what like what if what if all of this works? Like as, as I mentioned at the beginning, like this is not implemented yet. Um, this at the moment just a concept that I think is promising. 
but uh, what what if we actually succeed? Uh, I think that would be pretty great. Uh, it would allow us to kind of delegate arbitrary problems of thinking. Um, like I mentioned the example uh, of how do I improve my mood, but really any kind of question uh, would fall under that. Uh, and we could delegate it by providing pretty mi minimal input ourselves. Um, we're delegating as much of the thinking as possible. Maybe we would only occasionally respond with these sorts of multiple choice responses. We, we'd only be limited in, uh, uh, in this task in by how much we're willing to pay for thinking on any particular problem. So in some sense, you can think of, about the goal here as uh, turning thought into a commodity. And I think like the, the fact that we uh, thus could leverage machine learning to help people think is pretty important because then if this really worked, uh, then over time as machine learning algorithms get better and better, uh, people would get better and better support of thinking through these questions that they care about a lot. Thanks. Uh, any questions? Twitter, the Twitter model, um, one of the main problems is figuring out who to ban. Um, assuming that question is even decidable, but uh, I mean, assuming that you can even figure out that somebody's trying to come back. Um, and one of the problems is you have outside back channels. So if you ask humans, should we ban X? For interesting X's, I can guarantee I can get you a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand people to say yes. Uh, sort of independent of whatever. Uh, I tried to come up with an example of somebody who shouldn't be banned. My best one was Mother Teresa, but I can easily think why one want, might want to ban Mother Teresa. So, uh, you know, that's given that <laughs> given that people are trolls, or at least a subset of them are trolls. How can you actually, uh, can, can you deal with that? Or when, when the corruption signal is much larger than the potential good signal, because um, the trolls are motivated. So I think one comment to make here is, unlike in the case of Twitter, um, there's no like, global kind of community that you're trying to optimize, but rather for any particular dialogue, any conversation, you're trying to respond optimized with respect to the values of the particular person that uh, you're talking to. So the problem to solve is like not to globally decide do we ban X or not, so, but rather like for any dialogue, if there's a contribution, is it something that the person wants to be there or is it something that they don't want to be there? Um, that, that of course is also a challenging, challenging task, perhaps uh, equally challenging to the issue that you raised. Um, I think they're the same strategies apply as to reward distribution more generally where you're just trying to predict this. Is the person going to want to have uh, the Mother Teresa answer her dialogue or not? Um, and uh, if there are some people who can give predictive signals about what that person wants to be there, maybe by upvoting or downvoting or um, adding specific comments, then you can use those signals to make those decisions. Any other questions?